You're tuned in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, guiding your gridiron journey, none other than your host, former NFL lineman, Ross Tucker. Oh, 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 yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a new week. It is a Monster Monday, and we've got the man, John Kuhn. Kuhn, longtime Packers fullback, and some other teams as well. Cannot wait to dive into some stories with John. Not a lot of news. The biggest news, LeJarrius Sneed. We'll get to that momentarily. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Coon. Yes. So excited to finally have my buddy from Eastern Pennsylvania, John Coon, on the show. Obviously, longtime fullback in the NFL. Steelers, I think probably most people remember him. From the Packers and then the Saints. Dude, how happy are you, by the way, that you have a sweet last name like Coon that like people say, like, I mean, I don't think you'd be nearly as popular if your last name was like Filippowitz, bro. Yeah, if, if I had a hard last name with, you know, 13 different consonants or a bunch of different vowels in it, might not have rung the same. But, you know, it, it, Green Bay's done this before. George Koontz has done it. Uh, they had Rizal Douglas most recently, and now Luke Musgrave. So anytime you get that deep ooh sound, you can get that whole stadium bellowing it, man. It's it's a great feeling. So in all sincerity, though, that that's that's like, I mean, you're popular because of how long you were there, how well you played, your style of play, that you played fullback, all those things. But that stuff helps, man. Like Heath for the Steelers or Muth, like that stuff, because that's something like everybody, no matter how big or small of a fan you are, everybody kind of gets into it. And it's like, it's like something that we're doing as a community together, you know? Yeah. And, you know, for a case like Luke Musgrave, who's a Green Bay Packer right now, they're yelling it out when he's making a catch on a first down for 15 yards on third and 11, right? For a guy like me, you know, I was getting a ball on third and one. I was getting a ball down around the goal line where it's kind of really if the offensive line does its job, it was super easy for me. But because it's easy to say, it's easy to yell, it's easy to cheer for, and it's easy to get on board. And and people, for some reason, I mean, they will remember how many plays you make, no matter how easy or how difficult they were based off if they could bellow that name out. You know, it's funny, just a quick aside, I'm sure there's no relation but when I was in high school, we're both Eastern PA guys. Our best basketball player on the high school basketball team was a guy named Andy Kuhn. And there was a big family, the Kuhn family. They had four boys and a daughter. They got Kuhn funeral home, the whole deal. But he was like my idol. I remember when he scored 1,000 points. He's the one that like taught me like how to play basketball. He's like, dude, just practice dribbling all the time. Because if you can dribble, you can go anywhere you want. So, John, I was like 6'5", 250 as a senior in high school at 135-person graduating class, and I brought the ball up, dude, at 6'5", 250, because I was always small, and all I ever did was dribble. So, anyway, no relation to Andy Kuhn or the Kuhn family, is there? No, not, none that I know of, but now I'm really interested. I, I, I'm going to have to figure out if there's a Ross Tucker archive for basketball highlights in high school, because that is must-see television. Well, it's funny. I've told this story before, but like if you ask my college buddies at Princeton or even my high school buddies, like, hey, was he really that good? Like he made the NFL. They'll all say the same thing. Like my, the Princeton guys will be like, well, he was 300 pounds and he was the point guard of our intramural basketball team and like would like drain three. Like I'm convinced to this day that's that's what enabled me to, to be able to play um, your story. I don't know if I've ever really asked you this. So you, you go to Dover, not a powerhouse outside of York High School, outside of York. Um, I'm assuming you just weren't that heavily recruited and you ended up at Ship. Like you didn't get any love from even like Delaware or Nova or anybody. Well, no, I'll be honest. I, there was a couple flyers I had out there. I had an opportunity to go to Penn State and, and walk on the spring semester of my freshman year didn't necessarily want to do that. My parents didn't have a whole lot of money, and that was a big financial investment. And then uh, we, we had a falling out with the Richmond Spiders, man. I, I was set to go there. I was fired up. Um, they, they were looking for a couple freshman running backs. 
I said, yes, I verbally committed. And then when it came to signing day, when it came down to like the week before or the week of signing day, I can remember being like, all right, well, now we need to make this official. And they came back and they said, listen, we, we offered three guys. We only have two spots available. All three of you said yes. So unfortunately, we're going to have to, we're going to have to pull that scholarship offer that we made for you. And at the time I was devastated, like completely devastated, Ross. Like I got my mind set. I, you know, being a Pennsylvania guy, you want to go to Penn state your whole life. And when that turned out to not really be where I was going to go, I reset my bar and my bar was right there. Richmond spiders. I'm going to go down there and I'm going to let my mark be there. Um, I did. I, I remember I went to Penn and they had a good running back at the time because Penn ran, I think some version of the wing tee or some sort of belly type of game. And there was a running back there by the name of Jim Finn, who was just about to graduate. He ended up going and playing um, with the giants for a few years and I was going to be Jim Finn 2.0. I mean, I had good grades in college. I didn't have or high school. I didn't have great grades. I was something like a 3.3, 3.4. My grades didn't get me into Penn. So then I had to reset again, and I reset on Richmond. I accepted their. I verbally accepted their scholarship offer. And then when it came to, I was dev. I, I mean, I'm, I'm getting knocked down peg after peg after peg before finally I had to completely reboot spring semester of my of my senior year of high school and find out where I was going, I was a late, I was a late addition to Shippensburg. I didn't actually, you know, agree to go to Shippensburg until real late in the process, probably April or May of my senior year. And that's because I had to start taking trips around PSAC schools to figure out which one I liked the most. Oh, dude, I never heard that story. Yeah. That is what you think you're going to Richmond, which is also like a really good academic school yeah. on a full ride. And the next thing you know, you're scrambling. That is brutal. Was that motivation for you at, at ship and throughout the rest of your career at all or not really? You know, a little bit, but I had one of those paths where there was constant hurdles. Every chance you had, there was a hurdle. Ross, I remember um, my first year in the NFL, I got, I got cut and I was told by Kevin Colbert of the Steelers, stay in town, stay in the hotel, the team hotel, um, we got your room covered for the rest of this weekend. There's a really good chance we'll bring you back to the practice squad. Well, Sunday rolls around, and that's when they're starting to sign the practice squad guys because they've been cut for 48 hours. And no call, no call, no call. Finally, I, I called my agent and I said, do you think they're calling me? Nobody called me to say yes. Nobody called me to say no. Nothing really happened here whatsoever. And my agent you know, he's got to get on the phone. He's got to talk to his client. He says, John, I think it's probably safe to drive home. And I was, again, it's one of those situations where you're devastated. You're like, oh, my God, I couldn't even get the call to tell me you're actually not bringing me back to practice squad. I stayed here two and a half extra days after our last preseason game because you said to stick around town. I didn't even get the call. Go ahead and head home. So, it, it, Ross, it was just one of those things where – you just get numb to it. You just kind of get used to it. And it becomes one of those things where as you go throughout an NFL career, you expect, you almost anticipate something bad to come so that you can overcome whatever comes your way eventually. You know what's so funny about that story? Uh, 2001 was my rookie year. Nobody told me that they only call you if they're going to cut you. <laughs> so Marty Schottenheimer said – to be in your hotel room from 8 a.m. to noon, like a four-hour window. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there, right? And at like 10.30, my phone rings, and I answer it real quick, and they're looking for Justin Skaggs, a wide receiver, to tell them they want to cut him and put him on practice squad. They're like, Justin? I'm like, no, it's Ross Tucker. And they're like, is Justin there? I'm like, no. Like, do you know where he is? I'm like, No. I said, are you guys going to, like, I said, what about me? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> Tell, give me the, and they're like, they're like, I don't think we're going to be calling you today. I was like, okay. Uh, and then they like hung up real quick. So I, I didn't even know what that meant. So dude, like 1205, I call Kenny Watson, a running back from Harrisburg who went to Penn State. He was undrafted rookie like me. And I, and he answers the phone like, hello. And I'm like, Kenny. 
He's like, yeah, I'm like, it's Ross. He's like, oh, man, you scared me, man. I'm like, I know, like, it's 12.05. Like, did we make it? He's like, I don't know. And so I finally called my agent. And my agent had to call the team, kind of like you. And my agent coming back is like, oh, man. Oh, man. I'm like, what? What? He's like, this is amazing. I'm like, what? He's like, you made it. I'm like, what? This is incredible. Like, it was, I get chills just telling that story. So I had a similar story. It just better. <laughs> I guess but, I would say yours is slightly better. <laughs> the circumstances. Hey, so how many fullbacks were even in the league when you were playing? I, I'm sure you counted them. I, I feel like there was a stretch there, John, where I feel like maybe only like half the teams even had one. Yeah. Do you remember? I, I'm guessing you knew at some point, like, what was the low water mark or the high water mark in terms of fullbacks in the league while you were playing? Well, you know, Ross, 2005 was my rookie year. So I came in right at the end of really gap scheme football, power, you know, counter tray, counter BIM, um, lead draw, all that good stuff where you had a big neck and you had big shoulder pads on. You maybe even had a cowboy collar or a neck roll or something, and you're just crushing with that Mike linebacker and or that Sam linebacker in a 3-4. I, I, that's when I came into the league. And honestly, the Pittsburgh Steelers, even though they cut me three times, they, they, they made my career because I came into that team with Jerome Bettis, Dan Kreider, and Deuce Staley, and I had to learn how to lead block coming out of Shippensburg. And you talk about a crash course. That's like going 400 level straight from the 100 level. And I had to learn and learn in a hurry. So um, big kudos to them for really having patience with me, bringing me back to a practice squad, let me learn on a practice squad and doing all that stuff because that really taught me how to block. And as the game started to evolve and, and went more pass centric, now you, it, you'll struggle to find teams that run 50% of the time now in the NFL. I mean, you it's hard to even find 50%, let alone when I first came in the league and it was like some teams running 55, 60% of the time. So I learned how to block in that, in that manner. And as the league started to spread out and linebackers started to get smaller, they started finding on offense that they could keep a tight end to really lead block because the middle linebackers have gotten smaller. They could find matchups there that they could exploit in a pass game for 60% of the plays and then lead block on 40% of the plays and not even that many because they would run more out of 12 personnel. So they could really, you know, use 10, 11 plays a game as a tight end at the fullback position. And I would say at its lowest was probably around, I would say like 2014, 15, 16, around that time. You could count around the league and find yourself anywhere between 12 and 16 fullbacks. And that was really, really about it. And I'm talking true fullbacks, guys that aren't necessarily putting their hand in the dirt and 12 personnel as the backside tight end, guys that pre uh, predominantly line up in the backfield or the BB as a lot of these offenses call. A lot of offenses don't even call it a fullback anymore. They call it a BB, a blocking back, a guy who, who can be a U, he could be, you know, an H, he could be whatever, but they put him in the backfield and, you know, at the lowest. And and I've been kind of seeing a comeback here as a true fullback, you, you would say, um, you know, with Alec Ingold and Kyle Juszczyk and the way that they use those guys. And some teams want to mirror that and mimic that. Um, but the days of a of a big sledgehammer type fullback, the Lorenzo Neal types, man, I, I just don't know if that's ever going to come back again. Uh, man, so much good stuff there. It's interesting. It feels like a lot of the good teams – you know, the Dolphins with Ingold, the Niners with Juszczyk, even the Ravens with Patrick Ricard, who's kind of a yeah. different animal with just how big that dude is. But it feels like a lot of the teams that are good have a fullback. And those guys provide a lot of value. I feel like especially if you can block like Juszczyk, but then also sort of be a weapon in the passing game, like I guess you can go all the way back to like Tom Rathman back in the day, right? Like, there's a lot of value there if you can do both those things. Like, I guess that's why ushek has been making so much money. Yeah, and, and Ross, I'll be honest with you, kind of the slow death of special teams hurt the fullback position too. 
right? The fullback used to be somebody that was predominantly a wedge buster or an L and R three on the kickoff team. He was the guy that was going to get a lot of double teams, but he'd be nice and he'd be a thick body. So he'd be able to absorb the special team and not get washed off the field. It was the guy that on kickoff return, he'd, he'd be back there. He wouldn't be in the middle of the wedge, but he'd be on the end of a wedge and he might be able to field one of those uh, squib kicks every now and then. So the slow death of the special teams really affected the fullback as well. Cause now instead of, I mean, teams really keeping six core special teams guys, like when we came in the league, that's not really happening anymore. They're keeping two, they're keeping yep. three. And then they have a lot of safeties, a lot of wide receivers filling in these extra spots, making special teams faster because there's really not that need for the girth, not that need for the size anymore. The, the Packers did a couple things this offseason, kind of feel like out of character a little bit, and I'm curious to get your opinion. For those who don't know, John has a radio show up in Wisconsin. He's part of the Packers' official radio broadcast. I've been with him on the sideline a few times. Josh Jacobs, they, they move on from Aaron Jones, bring in Josh Jacobs as a former running back. What was kind of your read on that move? You know, it, it, we we knew running back was going to be addressed here in Green Bay. Absolutely. It, it was a must. Um, A.J. Dillon was to be a free agent. Aaron Jones is going to turn 30 years old this going into this football season. So we knew it would be a spot. We just thought it might be a little flip-flopped. We, we didn't anticipate Aaron Jones. And even Brian Gutekunds came out after the season, and you saw the worth of Aaron Jones the last five games of the season, rushed for over 100 yards, including – the two playoff games. I mean, he was he was really something to finish the season. Uh, but but I really think the injuries that he had this year really limited, I would say, probably 11, 12 games for him, his availability and his production. And because of that, the Packers, they wanted to they wanted to take a discount on that. They wanted to be able to financially set themselves up so that they could sign some more players. It's the first time they've been able to really have some um, alleviation for that salary cap penalty, which was the COVID year when they started bumping contracts out into the future and Aaron Rodgers' big contract. So they got themselves some room there and Aaron Jones was at a big number. They asked him to take a pay cut and to Aaron's credit, he got more money going to Minnesota than what he would have gotten here in Green Bay, what they felt like they could afford to pay a 30-year-old running back here in Green Bay. Everybody would have loved to have seen him stay. And with with him turning that down, Green Bay had to look somewhere else because one thing about Matt LaFleur's offense is you need a dynamic run game to set up your play action, and play action is everything in this scheme. So they go out there and they pick up the guy who was all pro just two years ago, guy who led the league in rushing just two years ago. And, uh, and really the way if you dive into his contract, the way it hits this year, it's a lot of cash in year one, which is $15 million, But the way that thing gets spread out, this is kind of a cap-friendly deal, at least for the first two years, if not even just the first year. And Josh Jacobs is going to come in at 26 years old, and he's going to be the bell cow, probably a little bit more of a bell cow than Aaron Jones even was because, you know, he's a little bit bigger, he, he's a little bit younger, so they can probably, you know, count on him being able to carry a little bit more of the load than just Aaron Jones. And then, because of the departure of Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon gets to come back, he takes a team-friendly deal. He got that long snapper addendum, which uh, which I think is hilarious that uh, if the NFL had that when we were playing Ross, we would have tried to play forever because that extra little one-and-a-half million-dollar bonus kicker that you get that doesn't count towards the cap, I mean, that that's a very team-friendly thing that they put in this last CBA. So the Packers got their running back position for this year settled, but I don't think they're done bringing in running backs for this season. Are you convinced Jordan Love is the guy for the next 10 to 15 years? And if so, when did you become convinced? You know, I, I, I started to get convinced throughout the middle part of the season, even when he was struggling, because his worst game, I would say, was about week seven against the Raiders. And you could tell his vision was getting there, but wasn't quite right. He was a second behind. He was thrown off his back foot. He wasn't convicted. And the next week we went out and we played Denver, or maybe it was two weeks later after a bye, we went out and played Denver. And that's when it really started to click. And he took it week in and week out from, from the Raiders to the Broncos to the Steelers. And these are all three losses. But each one of these games, you can see the progress that he makes. And then it turns into a homestand where I think he played the 
the Chargers, the Chiefs, and the Lions in three consecutive weeks. And he just continued his progress against three teams that, or at least three defenses that I considered pretty dangerous. And in fact, the Packers were the only team to score over 25 points on the Chiefs last year. And that was with Jordan Love really making his mark in a Sunday night football game. So I got convinced midway through the season, this guy has what it takes to be the guy. And as he continued, he, he never really had a drop off. He had one kind of dud of a game at the end of the season against the Giants, but he never let his foot off the gas from the midway point of the season on out. And it really goes to show you, you can sit around for a few years, but you need that time on the field. Right. He had three years of sitting and watching from Aaron Rodgers. He needed that time on the field to get game speed, and he needed time to develop with some young wide receivers. And about the time the wide receivers developed, that's when you really started to see Jordan Love. I, I think they got their guy, and I think they got their guy for a period of time now. Unbelievable. Three in a row. Yep. Favre, Rodgers, Love. Check him out on social media at Coon. J30, he is the man. I love hearing stories like that. Uh, the Richmond, not that the, I like hearing your terrible stories, but that the Richmond story, the Steelers story, and then you go on to play double digit years in the NFL as a fullback and you parlay that and all the stuff you got going on up in Wisconsin. John, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And, and I'm going to pull a Ross Tucker here, and I'm going to say, do you have time for one more story since you like stories? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go okay. for it. So, so, so I gave you a lot of really sad stories and stories about like trying to overcome these hurdles. Well, it, when Pittsburgh brought me back to the practice squad, which was that same year that they cut me and left me hanging in the hotel, I can remember I went out to, to the West Coast and I signed – um, an arena league deal with the team that was the best in the arena league at the time, the San Jose Sabercats. And um, a, a part of that deal is, hey, you sign this deal, but we have this other league exemption. If you go play with another league, that's perfectly fine. This contract will be waiting for you when you're done. However, if you attend our regular season camp, like going into the season, the true training camp of the arena league once you come in you can't leave halfway through the season this isn't like triple a baseball where you can bounce up bounce down once you attend you got to stick out one full season so i can remember it was a monday night and i had my bags packed to fly out to san jose to go start this camp and and live in san jose for the next six months and play arena league football and the pittsburgh steelers were playing uh the indianapolis colts on monday night football they had Bob Sanders as their safety. They were they were a bunch of badasses, and and they beat the Steelers down. They they kicked their butts. And it's about eleven o'clock at night after the game, and I get this phone call. It's Kevin Colbert, and he says, "John, um, we need we we need you to come in. We, we're going to bring you back to the practice squad. The Pitts or the Green Bay Packers just took Noah Heron off of our practice squad to be their running back because Najee Davenport got hurt." So I said, are you serious right now? He goes, yeah, uh, how fast can you get to Pittsburgh? And I told him, I said, I can get there in three and a half hours because my bags were already packed. They're already in the trunk of the car. I was catching a flight at five o'clock in the morning. So I'm driving down the turnpike at one o'clock in the morning with my agent on the phone. And I, I'm telling him, make sure you tell them, make sure you tell San Jose, I'm not getting on this plane. They're not going to avoid this contract with the Steelers because minicamp starts tomorrow. I need you to make sure they know I'm going out there to Pittsburgh. And luckily I made it out there and everything was good. And, uh, I, and I didn't have to worry about it again. Dude, I love it. I, we, we could both tell a million more stories. Thanks so much, man. Really appreciate it. Anytime you want, Ross. That guy is awesome. That, that should be the show, right? Is like just telling stories with other awesome guys. I'll tell awesome stories. He tells awesome stories. We're just awesome together. You know what else is awesome? DiGiorno. They know it's not easy to plan a watch party on a budget. Got to have the perfect setting, perfect squad, perfect eats. You're a game time mastermind. You know that grabbing DiGiorno Classic Crust Pizza can bring home a dub because it's packed with half a pound of cheese, sauce, other toppings, comes at an incredible price. Make the game winning call. Grab a DiGiorno Classic Crust Pizza from the grocery store today. It's not delivery. It's DiGiorno. Do what I did on Saturday night. Wash it down with several Labatt Blue Lights with friends. So yummy. Living life to the power of we. Always enjoy responsibly beer. Labatt USA, Buffalo, New York. 
Tux Takes. All right, Ross. The Chiefs, they trade franchise tag quarterback Legereus Sneed to the Titans for a 2025 third-round pick and an upgraded 2024 seventh-round pick as Sneed gets $19 million a year, $55 million guaranteed. Right, that's the big move. The Chiefs need the cap space for the other guys, Creed Humphrey, Trey Smith, etc. They have other corners. The Titans are not afraid to spend money. I think Rand Carthon feels like they need better players. They need them now. That was by far the biggest news over the weekend. I think we're done here. Thanks for tuning in to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also check out Even Money, Fantasy Feast, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network on Samsung TV+, Plus, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. Shout out myfrontpagestory.com. Birthday, anniversary, just because. Just because I love sending you a signed autograph. That's why, just because. Myfrontpagestory.com. Automatic autograph. If you get that for a loved one for any reason, backofficeschedule.com, steakhousesports.com, humanheadnyc.com, 